reading of Philippians chapter 14. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Sintishi to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned but you've had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I have received gifts from Ephroditus, the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, good evening. Do turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, and uh, in a moment we'll see the uh, headings on the overhead projector so that you can have a good idea of where we're going with the material this evening. Before we do, you're looking uh, a little weary, but basically in good shape. Are you enjoying spring harvest? You're on the final full day today. But you are proof of that scripture that those who endure to the end will be saved and you are you're getting there i wrote a a short poem in honor of uh, spring harvest guests who are approaching the end of their time at spring harvest mary had a little lamb it was given her to keep she brought the lamb to butlins where it died from lack of sleep um, <laughs> I suspect you're doing pretty well if you're making it through this very heavy week, packed full with seminars, Bible readings, celebrations, uh, 
I believe conversations in depth over coffee after all of those where you hammered it out, disagreeing with each other or agreeing with each other about some point that you heard. I'm sure that there's confusion reigning uh, and that your mind is suffering from stimulation and information overload with all the kind of things that you've got crammed into your brain. But I don't want there to be any confusion tonight. I want it to be clear uh, and simple from God's word. Unlike a, a new, uh, newly ordained Baptist minister who was uh, very new to the concept of baptism and to communion, and he prepared very carefully uh, all these things, but was extremely nervous in his first year in his first church, and he got terribly confused about what happened when, and he did his first baptismal service, and he got the candidate down into the pool and was really uh, about to stutter and wondered what to say to the baptismal candidate, and uh, got terribly confused between communion and baptism. It was one of those sacraments. And so he said confidently in the candidate's ear, and drink ye all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I pray there will be no confusion tonight. Very, very easy in all this welter of information that you've received, to miss out on the focus that God wants to bring through his word. So let's find out what that focus is with our Bibles open at the very last chapter of the book of Philippians, Philippians 4. And with the acetate on the overhead projector, you'll see that we're going to talk about a generous church in its widest sense tonight. But we're going to talk about growing in six key areas. And as you go home from spring harvest uh, tomorrow lunchtime, we want to pray that you will, as we've looked through at the struggling church, the humble church, the visionary church, the generous church, the growing church, that we'll take back with us wherever we go a wonderful sense of what God has done and is doing in our lives. Well, again, some of you will be wanting to note this as an outline for the chapter. First of all, growing in verses 1 to 3, relationships, verses 4 to 9, discipleship, verses 10 to 13, maturity, verses 14 to 20, generosity, verses 21 and 22, evangelism, and verse 23, growing in growing. And I'll explain what that means when we come to the final point this evening. So let's just run through those six sections again. It will give you a flavor of where we're going. Growing in relationships, one to three, growing in discipleship, four to nine, Growing in maturity, 10 to 13. Growing in generosity, 14 to 20. Growing in evangelism, 21 and 22. And growing in growing, exclamation mark, verse 23. Thank you. So, how does Paul begin this final chapter? Therefore, my brothers, and uh, using that term to include the whole church family, referring to uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord of all ages who make up the church family in Philippi, you whom I love. You see the kind of relationship the Apostle Paul had. He planted the church in Philippi. He cares for it a great deal. It's not just another church and another letter. It's a church for which he has both passionate concern for their spiritual well-being and a genuine pastor's love in the deepest place for the people. I love you and I long for you. He longs for the very, very best for them. Actually, that's one of the very important marks of leadership, whether it's the kind of apostolic ministry, the translocal ministry that Paul exercised, where he has longings for a variety of churches, or whether it's the pastoral, uh, local ministry, where a pastor has to both love his people and there has to be a longing. It's something slightly different from love. It's a genuine passion to see the people of God in that place go on and grow on in him. Presenting, as the book of Colossians tells us, everyone mature in Christ. It's the kind of longing that doesn't want the people of God to stay where they are, but the longing that always wants them to be pressing on, straining ahead towards the prize. It's important for us in any kind of leadership to remember that, whether we're leading our home group or leading our church or leading some other group, that the biblical values for leadership are to be loving to the people we're attending to serve and longing 
that God will bring them to wholeness, that their hurts will be healed, and longing that he will bring them to spiritual maturity. So the focus is not on our performance, but the purpose is on the coming to wholeness of the people of God. So he loved them and he longed for them. My joy, typical word, as we've seen so often in the book of Philippians, you're such a, a, a value to me. I'm proud of you. You're a joy to me. You're like children who I've seen from the point of new birth all the way through spiritual puberty and adolescence. And some of you are coming into spiritual adulthood. And you're such a joy to me as I see you growing and developing. Speaking as a pastor, one of the great joys for me is when you see someone be born again. And then over the months and years, you see them grow into wonderful Christian mature individuals and you see how rapidly God moves in their lives and then how slowly for a period but how on and on they go on in the things of God that's a thrilling thing for any leader so Paul says you're my joy you're my crown that's a word which is a kind of laurel wreath given to a, a victor we see it perhaps in the, a Grand Prix uh, context that there, there wasn't a Grand Prix actually at Philippi uh, but uh, but there were other things, uh, Olympic medals and so on, which, for which a glorious crown, uh, uh, an ivy kind of wreath would be given. That's what you're like to me. You're my joy and my reward. I thank God for you. And so stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Go on doing what you're doing. You started well, now finish well. Stand firm. And there's great pressure around you, Philippians. You know that when I was with you, says Paul, I was thrown into jail. I was beaten. I was horribly mistreated. I know you're going to come under similar persecution and pressure. But when you do, stand firm in the Lord. He is the one who will give you the power. And some of us are going to go back from this place with the words of Philippians ringing in our ears and teachings from seminars and I believes are deep in our hearts. And we're to go back to positions sometimes of immense difficulty and great personal strife and we're to go back not to waver not to be knocked off course but to stand firm and not in our own strength gritting our teeth against the gale of oppression or persecution or struggle but in his strength and power the resurrection power we spoke of last night to stand firm in him because when we go back we're going to have to grow in our church in relationship. It's vital if anything is to occur well, not simply that we have slick, clever programs, although it's important to have good programming, but even more important is that relationships in the church are right. You can have the best programming in the world, but unless relationships are right, the programs ultimately won't work. And so we need to have relationships which are fresh and strong and right. And there were two women in the church, Euodia and Soon Touchy. Uh, actually, Syntyche is how you pronounce it. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche. It's interesting in the, in the original language, the construction is utterly fair. It's not as if Paul is favouring one against the other. He may believe that one is more to blame than the other, but he is utterly fair and he uses the same appeal word in exactly the same way to both women, appealing to them both. I plead with you and I plead with you. I plead with you equally. I want you to resolve this situation. Agree together in the Lord. And yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow. Now, the, the original word here might be the name of someone. Paul might be writing to the leader. The original word, which could be a name, uh, is Sissy Gus. And well, if your name was Sissy Gus, you probably wouldn't want to be known as that, but you'd want to be known as Yoke Fellow. <laughs> now, we're not sure whether this is the name of the church leader in the church at Philippi, or whether it's just meaning some fellow leader, whether it's addressed to a specific individual, or it's just saying to people in general, come alongside these women and be a comrade, be a friend, be a fellow ambassador with me to them in my absence, stuck here in prison, be my representative and draw them together. Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Interesting word, contended. They fought with me in the cause of of Philippian evangelism. They have shared the task of sharing the good news. Many people have somewhat cynically talked about these two women falling out in the life of the church and said, you know, isn't that just typical? That's where the problem lies in the church when the women fall out. I personally do not hold this view. <laughs> 
and it's nothing to do with cowardice. <laughs> it's to do with the thrust of Philippians 4, verse 2. The point about these women is that they were co-workers with Paul. This is no dismissive put-down to the women in the church. We're not talking about the tea committee here. We're talking about two women who shared in the great task contending, fighting with Paul on the side of the gospel, bringing the good news of Jesus to the Philippians with his blessing and alongside him as co-workers. Actually, this verse is a challenge to us to increasingly see men and women involved in life and ministry in the church, leaving aside the question of women's ordination or women in leadership about which evangelical Christians hold differing views, leaving that aside, hardly any of us can fail to grasp that women are among at least one group who the Church of Jesus in the last 50 years has very badly treated with the horrible indictment upon us that we have been willing to send them to the worst possible places of the world, Africa, India, and wherever else, to suffer for Jesus and do what they wanted, and were totally unprepared to use them at home. And it seems to me to be that is not possible to continue without repentance, with that kind of attitude. And so it's nothing to do with the big issue of women in leadership about which there will be differing views. But that what we have here in, in Paul are these two women who worked with him. They were fellow soldiers in the fight. They worked with a chap called Clement, about whom we know nothing else. And others sharing in the good news of Jesus. What a wonderful thing it was for them to go about sharing with this task. And that's one of the reasons why Paul's so concerned. This is no minor backroom squabble among two insignificant people. These are two workers in the church who are squabbling and falling out. And he pleads, does Paul, with the yoke fellow, whoever he is, get stuck in there and sort it out. And for some of us tonight, this growing in relationship, this word comes to you. Some of you... Are you Odia and Syntyche? Some of you are going back into a situation where there's someone in your church you're not speaking to or you're on very bad terms with and God says to you right now in this tent tonight, I plead with you, agree in the Lord. Go back to make whole those relationships, to say sorry where you need to say sorry, to ask forgiveness where you need to ask forgiveness and if you think you're entirely in the right, you're probably not. And to remind yourself to build those bridges. And for some of you, you're called to be the yoke fellow. Some of you in leaders here, have, uh, leaders here have been very badly damaged. A war is taking place in your church fellowship. And you've got to go back and grow that church in relationship. Or grow that home group in relationship. And you're being called to be the sissy gus. The yoke fellow. The person who brings them together. And you're terrified of doing it. And I don't blame you. Because what happens usually when we arbitrate in wars, in churches, is that two individuals become resolved and then they both hate you. <laughs> Some nine months ago, I was invited to uh, Congress House in London for the celebrations of 125 years of the Trade Union Congress. And I heard Norman Willis give his retirement speech. And he said, this has been a difficult time for the trade unions. And he said, I came into this movement with high hopes and many of them have not been realized and he said I started off as the referee and too often have ended up as the ball <laughs> now I heard that very clearly and many of us are going back believing that we've got a role as referee a peacemaker and we are frightened that we're going to end up as the ball hurt ourselves and damaged by others I plead with you says Paul and he pleads with us across the centuries to come together in wholesome relationships. Many a church is held back from truly proclaiming the gospel in its community, not for lack of willingness, not for lack of skill, but for deteriorating, broken and damaged relationships unresolved. We must see resolution in our churches. Not before we evangelize, we've got to go on evangelizing and keep on evangelizing. If you wait till the church is perfect before you evangelize, you will be waiting till the second coming. But we must be working together to build relationships with each other that are strong and healed and restored. And notice that the rest of these fellow workers whose names are in the book of life Sometimes people squabble in churches. They're very unhappy to have their name on the same church roll as somebody else, but they're perfectly happy to have their name written in the same book of life as everybody else. 
We have to grow in this area in our churches. There has to be healing and restoration in our relationships. We have to work hard at those things. Notice that these two individuals are singled out. We know very little else about them, apart from the fact that they'd fallen out. But they form part of the great army of God that is going to make a difference in Philippi. And it won't make a difference in the way it ought to unless they're changed. And Paul has got a grasp here on a very significant principle. That individual believers are vital for the cause of the kingdom. And when God writes his church history, in a church history book no one has read yet, in human terms it might have the names of Wesley and Whitfield and Spurgeon and Carey and others, but in God's church history there may be the names of a thousand men and women you have never heard of, like Clement and Euodia and Syntyche. Individuals who make a difference in our world. This country isn't going to be won to Jesus Christ by five or six superstar preacher, teachers, healer, missionaries, whatever, doing a great thing on a thousand platforms. It's going to be won by hundreds of thousands of ordinary believers with right relationship with God and right relationships with each other. That's how it's going to be won for Christ. <clears throat> Ordinary people in ordinary situations. Forget the superstar mentality. Ordinary people, brothers and sisters, feel this. Feel the weight of it and the privilege and responsibility when God writes his history. Who knows who in this big top will be in God's role of honour because they were faithful. They may have been known by nobody, but your prayer or your activity may have been the trigger for thousands to come into the kingdom of God. On an April day in 1855, on the streets of Boston, a Sunday school teacher walked back and forth in front of a shoe shop, wondering whether he ought to go in or not. Eventually, he decides to go in. And seeing the shop half empty and the boy he's looking for isn't there, he pushes on back into the stockroom. And finding the boy, asks him why he wasn't in Sunday school the past Sunday. A guy in his uh, early teens, probably. And he talks for a while, and eventually he with the boy kneel in that shoe shop. And Arthur Kimball, the Sunday school teacher, leads D.L. Moody to faith in Christ in that shoe shop in Boston in April 1855. And then D.L. Moody has a powerful evangelistic ministry as he grows older and comes to Britain and preaching in the church of a young pastor called F.B. Meyer in the north of England. This young pastor grasps the vision for evangelism. He's excited by it. And he goes back to America and preaching in a university setting, a guy called Wilbur Chapman is converted, who then goes on to be a hugely successful evangelist, drawing together evangelists and ultimately inviting an evangelist called Billy Sunday to come and to speak in the university setting. And Billy Sunday is then invited down into North Carolina to call some ministers together to talk about preaching the gospel. And they decide to have a mission and a crusade and invite another evangelist, Mordecai Ham, to come and to preach. And they preach in a tent, smaller than this, rougher, less comfortable but he preaches for three weeks and on the last night of the third week at the very last meeting of the crusade in the last verse of the hymn a young man walks to the front kneels in the sawdust and gives his life to Christ and the man's name is Billy Graham and all because Arthur Kimball went in a shoe shop in 1855 Euodia and Syntyche are here tonight. If you're here together, make up before you leave spring harvest. <laughs> the true yoke fellows are here tonight. Go back into your setting, empowered by God, to plead with these folks that wholesome relationships will characterize our church so that powerful gospel presentations can be maintained. So we need growth. <coughs> Excuse me. We need growth in relationship. And then we need growth in discipleship. Verse 4 following. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I will say rejoice. Have you heard that before in Philippians? Praise God. Rejoice in his goodness. I know things are difficult. I know as yet these two women aren't reconciled. I know as yet there are internal tensions and external pressures. But go on rejoicing in the Lord. Brothers and sisters. Let me say this, not in a glib, superficial way, but our attitude should be one of gratitude. That's the point. That's what we're about as believers, even in times of deep sadness, not a superficial, giggly happiness, 
but a deep-seated joy in all that God has. Let your gentleness be evident to all. If you're going to grow in discipleship, you need to be gentle. Actually, this word is almost impossible to translate into English. Dozens of versions have tried and come up with different kinds of words and ideas. The Greeks used to say this word means justice, but more than justice. Not just fair, but going the extra mile to be compassionately fair. Be gentle with each other. Brothers and sisters, does there need to be repentance tonight from an abrasive attitude? Some of us need to be delivered from always being right and feeling it's God's will for us to share that truth with the world. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Again, people are divided about whether this means the Lord is close at hand to you, the Lord is near with his presence, or the Lord is about to come soon in the second coming. These are very well-known verses. You must have read them quite a few times, some of you. So does it mean the Lord is close at hand? Or does it mean the second coming is imminent? I wonder which you would vote for if you had an opportunity to decide. How many of you think it's the Lord is nearby, near to you in his presence? Raise your hand if you think that's what it means. Thank you. Please put your hands down. Hands up if you think it means the second coming is imminent. Please put your hand up. Thank you. Now, I'd like to tell you that I am absolutely convinced that it is one of those. <laughs> I'm sure a, great, a greater Bible scholar than I would say it was both. <laughs> One way or another, the Lord is near. Be careful about that. And it's not just a threat, it's an encouragement. The Lord is near at hand. If you're going to grow on in your discipleship, don't ever forget that walking with you day by day in every circumstance of your life, the Lord is near and he is near. The end of the world, the destiny of the planet, the purpose of what we're about will be wrapped up in this coming event when Jesus comes for us. So don't be anxious about anything, even the pressure from those Romans who are making it difficult for you. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests for God. And when you do, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will put an armoured garrison around your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so if you're going to go on in this discipleship context, if you're going to grow on into maturity, what you're going to find is, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to find that problems will come. And when they do, remember this, to rejoice, remember to be gentle, remember the Lord is near, and remember to pray about everything because when you do, God will send a garrison around you and he will be looking out for the lack of peace that so easily invades our heart and he'll be forcing it away from you so that peace will be your lot, your portion in life. And out there, all sorts of turmoil may reign, but a new peace and a new strength and a new hope will come to be yours. What a thrilling and amazing thing this is, that we have prayer as an option, brothers and sisters, that it isn't something uh, that we don't have access to, but something we do have access to. And we, we're brilliant at talking about prayer, aren't we? We're great at reading books on prayer. We're great at talking about prayer. Do you ever go to those prayer meetings which say, and now we're going to have an hour of prayer. The first 45 minutes are talking about praying, and then 15 minutes of prayer. We're very good at talking and very bad at doing. Brothers and sisters, God has given us a wonderful, wonderful antidote to worry and to tension. There's praise and there's prayer and it will lead to peace. So get those things clear. Don't just talk about prayer, the Apostle Paul says. Actually pray. Petition is the word he used. Come to God urgently. There's that lovely parable of Jesus in the Gospels where there's a judge and the importunate widow. When I was younger, I thought that meant unfortunate widow. She was just unlucky to get this judge. <laughs> Actually, importunate means that she went on nagging away at him. And the judge says, I will give this woman justice, irrespective of her case, just to get her off my back. Because she comes to me. And then Matthew 7, 7, ask and you will receive. Present continuous. Go on asking and you will go on receiving. Go on knocking 
and the door will go on being opened unto you. And then that lovely middle section there about going on seeking and you will go on finding. And so we're to be petitioners, those who come to the throne room again and again and again where God is and say, Lord, we need your help to hammer on the gates of heaven and long for him to move. That's the problem. We think prayer is coming to God and saying, bless me, I feel worried and going away. No, it's the kind of prayer where you've got the Old Testament great saint of God wrestling with the angel all through the night. And as the dawn comes, the angel has to, to be away. And uh, the, the great saint of God says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that's the passion in prayer the church needs to rediscover. Not the perfunctory prayer of a prayer meeting gone bad. But the powerful prayer of the saints of God saying to him, we will not let you go until you bless us. The petitioner prayer, the personal prayer that goes on petitioning this great king until the judge of all the earth responds. Not that he is unwilling to give the first time we ask, but he is simply looking for soldiers and warriors who are serious enough about the business of prayer to persist in it. And then peace comes. Finally, brothers... Whatever is true, and this finally is a bit more accurate, because we are very near to the end of the chapter. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, that is, whatever is reliable, tested, certain, whatever is noble, he says, think about these things. Have your thoughts fixed on... If you want to grow in maturity, have your thoughts fixed on these kinds of things instead of on the base gutter kinds of things so that you can be absolutely sure your focus is in the right place. Too much of our focus is on the low things and not the high things of our lives. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, that means without any uh, disfigurement or blemish, Whatever is lovely, that word's only used here in the whole New Testament, and it's used once in the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, in Esther 5, verse 1, where it talks about Esther being uh, lovely but lovely on the inside. A special kind of loveliness, whatever is admirable. If there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So what we need here is thoughtfulness that our brains engage what is beautiful and holy and high and not engage things which are always lowly and sordid. And humanly speaking, our natural cells tend to gravitate towards what is low and so our minds get filled with things which are not beautiful and honourable and true and pure. And if we're to grow on in discipleship, if we're to grow on into maturity, we'll have to develop new thought patterns. Because we might not be what we think we are, but what we think we are. Or to repunctuate that sentence so you follow it, we are not what we think we are, but what we think we are. And our minds are crammed full of all sorts of stimuli from our surroundings, from our televisions, from our radios, from all sorts of uh, situations. And it is so easy for them to become so solid that thinking God thoughts becomes increasingly difficult because the cynicism and materialism of the world has so invaded our minds that we are unable to think those holy and those pure thoughts after him. And we have to watch that constantly because we live in a world where much of our media is dominated by a mindset which is anti-God. And therefore, though we shouldn't throw it all out, the baby with the bathwater, and get rid of it, we should be much more discerning than we are. We need to ask God for the gift of discernment about what we allow to come into our mind. Because when we fill our mind with junk like a computer, junk in means junk out. And what you put in there will ultimately sully and spoil. And so Paul says, now listen, you know all this. Why are you allowing yourselves to be sullied in this particular way? What you have learned and received, handed down by tradition from others, what you've learned and received and seen in me, he goes on to say in verse 9, do that. What an incredible thing that is. Model yourself after me, says Paul. What believer can honestly say that, but we ought to be able to? If we're growing in maturity, we should be saying to the young Christians that we're mentoring or discipling or apprenticing, look at the way the gospel works itself out in my life. Not arrogantly, not self-centeredly, but they need models of Christian maturity. Who is going to be a model of Christian maturity for the young people of our day and generation? Who will stand up 
in this tent this week at Spring Harvest and go home saying, I commit myself not simply for my sake to walk with God, but to be a model of maturity to the thousands of new Christians and young people in my church who need to look to me. That's a huge request. Now, the difficulty is most of us are failures in that area, and so we need not guilt, but lovely healing and, and release. My wife says that I'm a model husband. And I looked it up in the dictionary and it said, model, small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> no, don't lose it again tonight, okay? <laughs> The big problem is that many of us are small imitations of the real thing. And God's calling us to model for others, younger Christians, newer Christians, young people, the glories of his incredible gospel. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern to me, verse 10 continues. And here is an incredible truth. <coughs> Excuse me that Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now there is the mark of a man whose soul, spirit, mind and body has been taken captive by God. I know what it is to be content. I'm right with him. I'm not grasping for more and more. Brothers and sisters, we live in a diseased, addictive society which is crudely and rampantly materialistic where we're always being forced to want more, more things, better things, bigger things, newer things. And we, we hardly have noticed in the church, but we've bought into the spirit of the age. And there's never going to be money to stop all these redundancies in Christian organizations. There's never going to be money for new evangelistic and missionary projects and projects of compassion. There's never going to be enough money to have the buildings we need and the programs we need and the people we need in the kingdom of God until, first of all, the people of God have learned to be content. Because unless the spirit of materialism is dealt with in me, we are always going to want more. And as we do, we will need the money to meet those needs. And inevitably, the things of God will be starved for the cash resources they need. And so any number of sermons speaking about tithing or giving sacrificially or generously are doomed to fall on stony ears, are bound to, to fail, unless the ordinary men and women of God, you and I, have learnt what it is to be content, to be basically satisfied. That's not, of course, to be satisfied with the state of the kingdom, satisfied with the state of the church, satisfied with my own spiritual life. None of that. Paul can't mean that. Otherwise, why in the last chapter did he say, I'm pressing on all the time to get the prize? No. He's talking about an inner stillness. He's talking about when the noise has stopped. He's talking about when the battle's far away. He's talking about when we're alone with God. And for some, there's an aching hunger in our soul, and it's not for God. It's for other things. And you know with any addiction, the more you have of it, the more you need of it, and the more you want of it. And the only desperation which will ever be satisfied is the desperation for God. All other hungers are doomed to be unsatisfying, and our materialistic world has so grabbed hold of our minds, has so won the hearts of God's people, has so seeped into the church from the culture around us, that we simply have no idea about personal contentment unless we surround ourselves with things. And Paul had learned in prison, or mixing it with kings and emperors, Eating like a lord or eating like a beggar, he had learned to be content. What an amazing statement. May God help us to receive that to ourselves and to learn to be content in that deeper, more intimate and powerful sense. My brothers and sisters, that's the key 
to generosity and giving. That's the key to release in so many areas. Because when we're content, we not only don't need things to make us happy, but we don't need status, and we don't need a claim, and we don't need the limelight. We don't need people telling us every 10 minutes how good we are. And when those insecurities have gone, and we're content with all we are in him, and we're whole as people, my word, the difference that makes in all these areas. Of course, it does lead, specifically, as it led the Philippians, to a generosity in giving. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Thank you for sharing with me. When I set out from Macedonia, not one church gave to me, except you only, but you sent me aid. And it's fantastic that you did. I'm looking, not for a gift, really, but for what can be credited to your account. I'm glad you sent me a gift. Thank you for doing it. But that's not the real point. I'm glad you did it because of what it tells me about you and your spiritual state. Because what it tells me is that you are generous and you yourselves have learned a degree of contentment and you've released from your very scarce hard-won resources gifts to keep me going. Thank you so much for doing that for me. Now, frankly, this may not have happened. Paul could have been pretty fed up with the Philippians because they might have sent him a gift, but they might not have sent him it often enough. I'm here rotting in this prison, chained to this soldier. I might have a certain degree of freedom, but I don't have my freedom in the wider sense. And there they are, miles away. They've got all this freedom. They haven't forgotten me. They haven't remembered me. Sorry, not even a postcard. I haven't had anything from them. Oh, well, yeah, Epaphroditus did come, but I mean, really, it was just a gesture. I mean, he could have been a bitter and twisted apostle. On the other hand, the Philippians could have been equally bitter and twisted. We're not sending any money to him. Every time we wrap up a food parcel, you never wear where he is. He's always off from one church, plant to another. You send it one place, he always leaves a forwarding address. Gets on a boat, next thing you know, it's shipwrecked. How can you look after this guy? And his letters are pretty few and far between. How can we keep up with him? He never sends us any news. Let's just write him a letter and not send him a gift. You know, the classic letter to missionaries. Thinking of you here and praying for you. A little note at the bottom. Psalm 23. Why don't they settle for that? Why do they actually send something? Because they have learned as people to give generously. And Paul has learned in the state he is to be content. And we here have got both sides of that equation, haven't we? We've got leaders, some of whom feel very damaged and hurt and in prisons. Some leaders here are in prison because you're in the prison of people's expectations and you just can't break out of it. You want to do the right thing, but you feel that the people of God you call to serve have so many expectations of you, so many demands, you can't break out of that prison and do what God wants because what they want seems to be more pressing and immediate. You'll have to answer to them on Sunday. God, you won't have to answer to for a few years yet. And so you're in a prison of people's expectations and you feel broken and hurt and damaged and you're going to go back to a church scene in which you're not sure how you'll cope, you're tired, you're weary and you've been thrilled at spring harvest but you know it's the last night tonight and the thing you know more than anything is that tomorrow sure as eggs or eggs is going to come and you're going to have to come here then to communion and then you're going to have to go home and even if you take the long route <laughs> you will eventually get back home even if you do go through Boston. <laughs> but you can't delay it forever. You have to go. And so as a leader, you're struggling with that. And then, of course, there are people here tonight who've been damaged by leaders. And they're saying to themselves, we're going to go back and our, our leader isn't here this week. But when we get back. <laughs> and so all that damage going on. And it's this glorious, generous spirit that God wants to release among us. Not the spirit of giving finance alone, though that's of course important, but the generous spirit of affirmation, of prayer, of recognizing that we have hurt and damaged each other, pastor and people and the other way around. We have hurt, we're not perfect. And there does come a time when we need to deal with that and offer it back to God and move on from where we are. Some of you were damaged once, dug a huge pit and have never left that. And for years have been in that damaged state. And you need this verse at the end of Philippians 4, verse 19, where it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory. Thanks for not neglecting me, Philippians. Thank you for not forgetting me. I know it would have been easy to forget me, but thank you for meeting my need with a monetary gift. And now I want to tell you something. My God will meet all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. You've given me from your poverty. God will give to you according to his riches. 
Thank you, Philippians. No God will meet your need. And around the tent tonight, damaged and wounded leaders and people, you need to hear that God wants to meet your need. And he wants to do it not as you look inside in a kind of morbid introspection, dear God, meet me, meet me. But brothers and sisters, God's going to meet some of you tonight as you start to look to meet the needs of others. And in meeting the needs of others, he's going to sneak in the back door and meet your needs almost without you knowing it. And so instead of the focus being on you all the time and how God's going to bless you and how he's going to help meet your needs... He's going to show you how even in your pain and struggle, you can bless other people. And as you start to do it, although it's not your motive for doing it, as you start to do it, incredibly God releases his blessing and meets all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And then, the last three verses point us to two things. <coughs> Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. This is growing in evangelism. It's really interesting that the Galilean carpenter has now found his way into the most powerful household in the world in the space of a very short number of years. Now, this probably doesn't mean that Nero's immediate family have been converted, but it certainly means that Nero's household, the broader spectrum of, of wealthy and influential, perhaps statesmen or servants or friends of the family, have obviously been touched by the gospel, and those soldiers with Paul have obviously been influenced by the good news. Well, he's chained to a soldier, for goodness sake, and he's probably dictating out loud the book of Philippians. Do you think the soldier has to listen to this? He can't go away, can he? You can see Paul, can't you? dictating all of this, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory, full stop, he says to the scribe, and then turns to the soldier and says, now would you like to know what that means? <laughs> I don't know whether Paul would have had access to John's gospel, but if he did, he'd probably share John 3.16 with him. As, as one thing for sure, he would have told the soldiers, either directly or by inference, as they were listening in, the good news about Jesus Christ. And the reminder to us as we go back is that evangelism doesn't start when the problems stop. Evangelism is the now event for all of us, even in the middle of our struggles. Paul didn't say, well, at the moment I'm in prison, so I can't evangelize. I'll wait until the circumstances change, and when they do, I'll get on with the witness task. Most of us are like that. We defer the task of evangelism until a better day. And the devil, in his cleverness, makes sure a better day never comes. Paul is sharing his faith clearly, confidently, and openly. And he must have spoken it out. Paul could not have just lived the life as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, when I was growing up, there was this kind of misnomer about evangelism that you just had to live a kind of godly life but never say anything about your faith and sooner or later people would ask you questions. I tried that and nobody ever asked me anything apart from if I was all right. <laughs> there are some things you can't do like a Christian and you have to articulate it and speak it out as Paul must have done. You can't, you can't play squash like a Christian. It's not possible. How, how do you do that? After you. <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense. We have to go back from this event, both living out the powerful gospel, being godly, as Paul most certainly was in his attitudes and behavior, but articulating what it means to be a Christian, coming up with a clear expression of our testimony and sharing all that God has done in our lives. And so we've had tonight a whistle-stop tour through this very busy chapter, which could have taken us uh, much, much longer. And we've ended up with growing about growing. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see the last, ver last word of this whole book, it says, Amen. And then at the bottom in the NIV, if you're following that, it says, some manuscripts do not have Amen. No Amen. Now, what does Amen mean? Now, I know you think it means you can now open your eyes. It actually means truly, or yes, that's, that's it. Verily, the King James Version used to uh, translate it. Amen. It's actually a direct transliteration of a Greek word. Amen. That's it. Truly, that's the case. 
The, the end of that section, yes, we confirm it and agree it, a full stop. But there is no amen. Probably there isn't at the end of the book. The amen is missing. There is no amen. And so when I get to the end now, I won't be saying amen. Well, I may. But it won't be amen. It won't be the end. It won't be the truly that's it, you've all sorted it out. The amen goes on. It'll be back in your local churches. It will be going on on the Lord's Day tomorrow and the next Lord's Day. And every day you're in your local churches, learning the lessons of Philippians and all the things about the church we've learned at Spring Harvest, going on doing what God is saying. No amen, no ending in sight, going on and on and on until that glorious day when there is an amen, when Jesus returns or death takes us to be with him. And all of us will be gathered again together on that great day. And we'll all remind ourselves of learning from this book of Philippians. And we'll stand together on the heavenly plain with thousands and thousands of believers singing hallelujahs to the Lamb, praising his name, celebrating his greatness, and reminding ourselves that then the amen will come. But until that point, we march on together as the people of God, growing and going for him. May God help us to do that.